Hello, everybody. Are we live? I think we're live. We are live. Oh, yes. Super live. Welcome Yay. to the <laughs> welcome to the crow's nest. Um, it's Tuesday. It's four p.m. Central. Do the math everywhere else. And today, special guest is Aaron Hartwell. Hello, Aaron. Hi. How are you doing today? I'm doing great. Yeah. How's your day been going today? Did you save any lives? Um, not today. Not um. Maybe yesterday. Yesterday was a better day. Oh, yeah. yesterday was a better day in saving lives? Indeed. Okay, good. As, as if some people may or may not know this, Aaron Hartwell not only is a fantastic award-winning MSP medalist inductee painter, but she's also a doctor. I mean, I painter probably comes first, right? Doctor kind of Absolutely. second. Absolutely. Yes, yeah. doctor yeah. is my hobby. Yeah. yeah, you let your you let your massive millions from painting fuel your doctor career, right? Yeah. Absolutely. It supports my work. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. So uh, we're going to be hanging out with Erin. We're going to be talking to her. Um, golly, we got a lot of people on. I see that Bob and Julie are on. Um, just to FYI, we're, um, Bob and Julie and I are in talks to get them on the show here soon. What do you think about that? Yes. That's pretty cool. It's pretty cool. Um, also, I didn't see if Derek has jumped on yet. Usually jumps, joins a little bit late, but guess who our special guest is for next week? Any guesses? Is it is it Derek? It would be Derek. That's it. That's oh, it. Derek. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. And then I heard that Dave, uh, Brother Dave wants to come on too. So get in line, Dave. Um, so I today... I'm going to be picking up a piece that I worked on and was working on at last ReaperCon. Um, this is a Bones 5 piece. It's a bronze golem, I think it's called, um, sculpted by Chris Lewis. And so I, there's, a, there's a lot of areas I still need to work on. So I was going to work on that while we're talking to Aaron um, and just kind of do some shaded metallic stuff. So if, I'll kind of talk about the process a little bit and uh, my steps and whatnot. But if you guys have questions that I'm missing as I'm painting along, rambling on with Aaron, um, please feel free to ask. But back to our most important guest, Aaron. Um, you said you're doing well today. Um, I like to kind of give the opportunity to talk a little bit about origin story. We all come to this mini painting world in different ways. And of course, like we mentioned, you're a doctor. Um, very important. And, um, but you know, why miniature painting? You know what I mean? You well, I was an art major before mm -hmm. I became a doctor, which I know is weird. Yeah. Um, I was actually a ceramics um, major, so I just threw pots uh -huh. in four years of college. And I learned how to play D&D &D in college because the guys said, oh, you should come play D&D &D with us. This is so much fun. I said, okay, yeah, that, that sounds good. I like this. I like this role playing thing. Mm hmm uh they had miniatures and they needed them painted so they said well you're an art major you paint these okay and that was how it started oh wow got into it fun yeah and then um did were you just playing games and painting at what point during this whole the fun process did you go oh i kind of like this i'm going to take this the next step and be a little more serious about it uh that was probably when the reaper kickstarter came out in 2012 and i said oh wow you mean people do this for a living <laughs> and they have a place on the forums where they go and they talk to each other about it. This is great. Oh, so, yeah. that's that's awesome. That's awesome. And then when was your when was your first ReaperCon? Fourteen. Fourteen. Wow. It mm -hmm. seems like you've been coming for much longer than that. Sounds like it. Yeah. 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 It's crazy. It's crazy. So, um, I have. I was. You actually. I had a a uh, little birdie. No pun intended. Um, talk to me about your ceramics thing. Um, so you were just throwing pots and whatnot. Was there something, was there a reason why that you stopped doing the ceramics portion and got into the medicine portion? Um, oh, so I was a double major. I was both biology and art, and I thought I was going to do medical illustration, but I found out it was mostly photography, which I don't really like. That's my uh -huh. least favorite part of miniature painting is taking pictures of everything. Oh. <gasps> no, I know. I, I'm sorry. I, I just, I, I'm bad with cameras. I can't get the light down. Yeah, you're realizing two. You're two photographers. Um, on, I feel the, really bad about it, but not everybody <laughs> can't do everything, and that is my. That's the thing I can't. That's the thing you can't do. So, sky but dive. <laughs> and skydive. I'm afraid of. Oh ice. gosh, I 100% with you there, Aaron. Like I, I couldn't. 
Why would you jump out of a perfectly good airplane? I mean, I agree. We, we spent all that time engineering I, a thing that could even be up there, and you want to jump out of it. I and just and it's still flying. I mean, if it were crashing, I, I, I guess you have nothing to lose. But oh, yeah, at that point, you're right. Nothing to lose. <laughs> well, you know. <laughs> well, yeah. I'd see. I would like to do it, but Michelle won't let me. Yeah. She she said I, there's no way. So uh, yeah. Well, it does know. show up on your insurance, so you know. Oh, that. that's true. Does it really? It does that end up? I did go scuba diving, so I had to wait a while to get life insurance. And maybe not. I'll go scuba diving, but I, I can't do that. Yeah, watching. that's true. I will too. In fact, I went scuba diving. In fact, I would even swim in a cage, um, in like great white infested waters. I would love to do that one of these days. Right. I thought about that, but I ran out of time. I I actually got to go to great white infested waters, but I stayed on shore. That was, that was safe. Oh, I would love to see one of those in person. It's on my it. bucket list. Oh, man. Someday. Someday. Yeah, that and, and uh, Antarctica. I get... in, in, in Antarctica to go there? Yeah, or however you say it, then yeah. not the south. <laughs> <laughs> you know, Antarctica. All right. So, you know, one of the things, oh, I want, I want to talk about this, and I mentioned it very briefly, um, was you are the very most the most current the, the newest inductee into the uh reaper msp hall of fame right Wait, no no marika marika uh, uh, last right. year. well let's just pretend that you are because okay. I, I i have a question i'll build around the idea that you are so let's just ignore okay, cool. that Marika was so you are so when that happened whenever it was last year or possibly the year before um was that did, what did that mean to you I mean, it was amazing. Yeah, I cried. I cried on like Twitch, like in front of everyone. Yeah, why? why I mean, why was it? Why was it such a big deal? I um, I don't have a lot of faith in myself. A lot. Um, I'm a perfectionist, so I always think I can do things better. Mm -hmm. And so, for somebody to tell me, "Hey, you're doing something really well," that's awesome. And I don't always believe it, and it still comes as a shock sometimes. But it's pretty awesome. You might make me cry again, darn it. <laughs> <laughs> It'll so, be hard and it's okay. No, yeah, no one's cried on the show yet, so that is a goal of mine. Um, <laughs> but that's funny. Um, so I've asked this, Rhonda and I talked about this a little bit, and it is something that um, I've talked to a lot of folks about. Uh, it kind of sounds a little bit like you might suffer from the imposter syndrome a little bit. Totally. Yeah? Have you... Do you, you told, you said totally. So you feel like that you do go through that a little bit and you kind of mentioned that a little bit. I mean, how do you, how do you overcome that? Cause a lot of times you're just in there painting by yourself and you're painting in your room or your hobby room or whatever, and you're creating this stuff. And how do you overcome that? Those, those, those doubts. I just keep trying to get better. Yeah. And if I'm not satisfied with something, I'm going to keep working on it until mm -hmm. I get tired of it and realize that it's just hurting my feelings. And then I'll move on to the next and abandon it um so i just keep trying to push and do something new and do something better um and i'm not i won't be satisfied until i keep doing something better the interesting thing is to hear that from you um because you are a massive risk taker in your pieces and i, th I have always found that to be very oh. ins inspiring from my standpoint too um your use of colors your um crazy use of colors i mean I like to kind of pride you color <laughs> I well, I like to pride myself of using a lot of colors and everything, but I will look at the pieces that you've done over the years and one of the reasons why I wanted to kinda of, I wanted to have you on was even to primarily have this color discussion was mm -hmm. you're not afraid to to throw anything on there. You're not afraid to go black and white either. Um, mm -hmm. which is awesome. But also um, throw you know, use of colors. Is there this is a really hard question to answer. I'm going to ask it to you anyways. Um, ha, is there anything when you start painting a thing, or you do you have a color scheme in mind? Are you going, I want to go for this overall color scheme, or is it just kind of happen through the distorted mind of Aaron? Um, there's a lot of different approaches, because sometimes right. I come up with a theme where, mm -hmm. you know, I want to, like I painted a Northern Lights dragon, so I wanted it to look like it had Northern Lights on its wings. Mm -hmm. So I thought, okay, well, I'll need to use blues and greens or something, you know, that looks like night. I kind of had the colors planned for that. 
-hmm. Sometimes I really just, I want to do something um, with complementary. So I deliberately go into it saying, all right, I'm going to paint with red and green. Um, that uh, mousely monster that I did last year, it was, I wanted to paint with red and green. So I used a really bright green and a really desaturated red. Mm -hmm. I planned that based on the colors. Um, but sometimes I'll start with something and I'll realize the colors aren't working and I'll think, okay, what, you know, from a color theory standpoint, what can I do to fix this? Where do I need to go? You know, this, this purple isn't working with this blue, something's not right. What do I need to do differently? Um, so I think it depends on the project. Mm -hmm. A lot of times I'll have like a picture in my head of how I want it to look. And then I go find the colors that match that. And that's, and you have to. Even when you were in, in school, you were a double major in two very distinct special, you know, specialties mm -hmm. or studies. One creative, one more analytical, right? Biology, you were very, very analytical. You have to know all the facts, right? Mm -hmm. And then ceramicist, you have to turn that side off and turn your creative side brain on. Mm -hmm. um, do you, that's just, do those transitions come naturally for you? Do they complement one another? Like you're in your doctor world all day long doing your doctor stuff. And, mm -hmm. and then is it, <laughs> is it, and I'm, I'm asking this because I, I, I'll, I'll, again, I'm not throwing her under the bus. There is no bus driving on this episode. Um, I do, I do plan on answering this one too, is, um, you're in your analytical world all day long. Is it, just uh, re helps your soul is just letting that all go and jumping into your hobby and trying to Definitely. turn off the analytical side while you're painting? Um, yeah, let me think. I mean, because I still use, like I'll draw pictures for my patients at work. So I'm still using my art side to kind of, as a visual learner, explain things with words and pictures so they understand it better. So I, I still get to use that sometimes during the day. But when I come home, it's really nice to do something that it isn't like life-threatening and isn't going to kill someone if I mess it up. <laughs> oh, okay. it's really nice. That's really reassuring. And I can, you know, sit with my, my soda and put on my peaceful background music, my favorite video game, and just not have to about work for a while. So, yeah. But then, you know, I mean, it's interesting because color is both science and art. It, mm -hmm. it lives in both worlds. So knowing both sides of it and studying it from uh, no, that's cool. That that's cool. It, no, it does. It does. And the whole not killing somebody thing too is I haven't thought about that side too. Um, I don't talk about my real gig job a lot, but it is very analytical also. Um, it's a lot of clinical studies. It's a lot of researching coverages and a lot of research. And, and then I get to talk to folks like you on a daily basis um, for my real job. But I, you know, I do look forward to... Um, that's where this show has been kind of different because this is still kind of within my work time frame, my work day. I just shift my lunch hour until this point um, so I can just totally disconnect. But yeah, it's it's a welcome break to just turn off that whole, okay, I've got to think about this analytically and just go, screw it, I'm painting now. And, you know, we're, and I, you know, I have a, again, I have a um, art background as well, an art degree. Um, and, uh, you know, I guess maybe you just become used to, you, um, comfortable with colors where you're not having to overthink them so much, but yeah, I'll go back and, and think about the intent of the color. And is that more analytical and less just, you know, creative stuff too. So yeah, it's interesting to, to hear that. I mean, uh, the shadows Raven just said you are magical. Um, Aww. yeah, let's make, let's throw lots of good compliments in for Aaron so Aww. we can make her cry. Cause I think we missed a crying oh, opportunity oh, earlier. Oh, <laughs> I mean, really, I, I'm oh, 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 so I wanted to go back to the MSP award thing too. And the funny thing is, is, you know, you were blown away, you were overwhelmed and stuff. Um, part of that is you get voted into that, um, and maybe not everybody understands, you know, kind of what it is. Um, it's kind of cool. And we're all, I mean, I was blown away when I had the honor of being inducted into it. But every year, um, the people that are in, just like you were this last year, um, we get an email and we make, make um, suggestions and, and uh, proposals. And I remember the year that you got voted in. I mean, it was pretty much a no-brainer. Pretty much it was, yeah, why is she not already in kind of thing. Um, so yeah, you, there was no question about, um, 
maybe Proctor is being replaced by an alien space clone. <laughs> that's that's Bobby yeah. Jackson being Bobby Jackson. Um, but no, it's uh, it was a no brainer. It was it was very well deserved. Um, but one of the other things besides your crazy use of colors um, that I've always been very impressed with, inspired by, also at the same time as your um, cool basses, right? Oh, I love basing. Yeah. Yeah. And you uh, kind of approached basing a little bit differently than I do. Your basing is really very, oh, um, fantasful, fantasyful, fantif. I, what's the, I, I can't even fantasy say. Fantasy. Fantastic. Yeah. But more fantasyful, fa fantasyful. Fantiful. Yeah. Fanciful. That's it. That's very. Um, I don't damn know. Damn it, Aaron, you're fancy. Fan, damn it, Aaron, you're fancy. Yeah, but it's very uh, just super creative, and you used a lot of different mediums. Like you were using sculpting clay um, and creating some bases, right? And I still do. Yeah. Talk to you a little bit about that. I mean, um, do you – are you concepting up an entire idea? Because sometimes when I – I'll just start painting a miniature that I like, and – the basing idea will come up during the process of painting that miniature. Or there's other times where I come up with this grand concept of a whole base and story, and then I got to scramble around and try to fin find a miniature that'll fit in with that story. Yeah, I usually do the second one. All right, yeah. I have this idea. Now what can I put there? Because yeah. believe it or not, sometimes the base is more important than the miniature to me, and I know that's sacrilege and terrible. But that's not at all. Not at all. I not love at all. it. Best part. You know, one of the, um, I started making, doing bases kind of early on. And one of my jokes, and it's, it was serious to a large degree, was um, I did basing to distract from my crappy paint jobs. <laughs> so I tried to, I tried to wow them with a the base so you didn't look as much at my paint job. Um, so I don't know. So yeah, but I'm not saying, because yours are always just so like, Damn, I wish I would have thought of that idea. Now I can't copy her. Yeah, so it was super cool. Oh, um, last week we did, we didn't paint, we did some basing stuff. And I kind of wanted uh, to kind of, I like to show, hey, this is what we were working on. This is what the final results were. Oh, that looks great. Uh, thanks. Ah. Thanks. So on the show last week, I just started painting the base. And you work fast. Yeah, thank you. You work fast too. You get a lot of stuff done as well. Um, and then, so I just kind of worked up the space, put a lot of grass tufts on it and, um, have the shield like that would have been his shield and he's up there praying. There's a little gravestone underneath. Easter um, eggs. You got to put Easter eggs in. See, yeah. I talked about that a little bit more. Um, you know, what's your philosophy on, on Easter eggs and whatnot? Love them. And yeah. they must be in every base. Yeah. And, and they need to kind of help with the story along, not just putting a, a critter in there to put something there, but what's the reason why they're there? Even if it's something super minor, have something and then have something. And maybe this space doesn't do the best example of it. Um, but I think one of my intentions was I did like this, this sword um, with the crow on it. And, you know, mm. again, why did I use a crow? I'm not really sure. But um, I, I liked I tried to position it as much as I could where the crow was looking back at him, right? Um, the crow was looking yeah. back at him. And then even when you see it here, you're looking around and you're drawing. But then if you look at this and you spend a little time, then he's still looking back. And maybe um, from a compositional standpoint, maybe that it's, he's looking back at, at, at this. Line of sight. Yeah, you want that. You want yeah. all things to draw to your center of focus. Right. The base should do that. It should should complement the miniature. It should draw focus to the miniature. Like you've got that kind of triangle working between the shield and the crow and the miniature. Triangles are really powerful in composition. That's yeah. No, and that's a great thing. And um, right. So on the front view here. And there's other things around, but, you know, a rule of three and that you got your triangle, like you're saying, mm -hmm. from the shield. The shield angle um, is pointing to um, the crow and the crow's mm -hmm. looking this way and then he's looking down to his book. So it's kind of making a sort of a triangle. Um, mm -hmm. you're, if you can do a base, start with just if you're learning 
kind of basing and just trying to break so you feel a little more comfortable, just make a base. But as you progress, really use that base to kind of um, tell a story as well. So this is what kind of I painted him, um, started this base, and initially this base was going to be, I was going to do this on the show. <laughs> And I started blocking it up before and just got carried away on a, on a Friday night or something and just ended up making the whole thing and started painting it. So on the show last week, I started making this base. And that was what we were, did on the show with Jen yes, last week. And so I just continued to work on him and finish him up and everything. So this piece was less of a true story, but more of... Um, just I like these figures a lot and I wanted to showcase them a little bit more and again there's a little crow but I did do a little I did a little Aaron Hartwell on here um yeah. and I I sculpted I sculpted in some runes into these rocks what do you think uh, you like oh, that nice. yeah actually when I was doing this I'm like well Aaron's gonna be on next week what's something that Aaron would do um I so I was like glow. yeah oh that's a good idea that's a good idea so and yeah, because it might take away from the rest. It might be too much. Yeah. So. I don't know. It's kind of cool. OSL is always fun. Yeah, OSL is fun, and it's something that maybe we could do an OSL um, thing one of these days. It's a lot easier than people think. Um, it's not as hard. Um, so, so um, I wanted. This is a question that um, I was talking to my our our good friend Rhonda Bender. I think Rhonda's on. Um, is uh, I was asking her for some questions for you and some more, some things to talk about. And one of her ideas was with your medical background, um, with your biology background, being a doctor, all that stuff that has the anatomy that you, the anatomy that you've learned of people and critters or whatever, right? Does that help you in any way with your painting process? Um, yes, because I like more realistic style, even though, you know, all my colors are kind of fantasy-like, like I'll do crazy impressionist stuff, but mm -hmm. I like the idea of making the face look like the face and not going Picasso on yeah. um, so it. It helps me to know why, like, you know, where the skin is thinnest on the face, because that's where you're going to get the highest shadows, which is closest to the sun, where you're going to get the top-down lighting. You know, why would you have you know, blue or green or red in parts of the face based on where the blood vessels are or where the um, uh, the fat pads are so that the skin is a little thicker so it's going to be a little ruby colored because there's going to be more capillaries there. Yeah, that it's definitely helpful for painting skin, absolutely. And this is a process that you're thinking about when you're painting a female face or something like that? Especially if it's a bust, if it's a larger figure. If it's smaller, there's only so much detail I can get into it. Yeah. Do you, um, do you, you switched over to painting larger figures in the more recent past, right? Is it getting bad? <laughs> I need bigger, <laughs> I need bigger canvases. <laughs> exactly. That's a, that's another running theme of this show is everyone's getting old and their eyes suck. Um, so, yeah. 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 So that's, do you, um, Jen and I talked about this a little bit last week about, um, do you find transitioning back and forth between the larger scale and the smaller scale helps you overall? I think the more I do the bigger figures, I can put more detail in the smaller ones because I, I feel more comfortable with it. Mm -hmm. um, but painting those tiny little pouches on the clock figures is really getting to me. Um, I've started <laughs> using my specs and, and that helps. <laughs> yeah, yeah, um, yeah. Buckles are getting to me, you know, but the, the yeah. nice thing is I've learned that increased contrast, I, I can sometimes get away with putting a deep shadow and a high highlight and it, it passes and it's okay. Mm -hmm. I'm okay with it. Mm -hmm. Do you, um, if you were going to uh, do a high level competition piece, are you more apt to go a larger scale than a smaller scale or it just, just depends? Depends. Yeah. Um, and it depends on how much stuff I want to put into the basing. Like I'm working on a, um, you know that Astral Ranger I did when I first came to ReaperCon, the guy with the cloak that looked like it had stars on it. Yeah. And, you know, the, yeah. Whole, the whole yeah. thing was sculpted with weirdness. I'm going to redo that now that I've learned color better. And that I've learned sculpting a little bit more. Um, mm -hmm. and I'm going to try to redo it with a female figure. Um, it's a small figure. And because I didn't want to do something ginormous that would take up a whole bunch of space because it takes too long to paint, I'm using the regular mini. Um, but I think I enjoy the bigger minis now more. Um, 
just because I feel like I have more space to play and I can put more detail. Um, and so maybe a little bit of both, yeah. Yeah, well, you just painted um, a Bones 5 Kickstarter. You, I mean, just painted. You did it over the summer, last summer. Um, the Cloud Giant? This Cloud oh, Giantess? I mean, yes. It's a beautiful, that's a beautiful sculpt. That yeah. Enjoyed it. Well, I mean, Gene did it, so it's pretty damn I know. good. Um, yeah. It's pretty awesome. But you did a fantastic job with it as well. I mean, it was, yeah. you knocked, you rocked that one. It was really good. It was really good. Yeah. I I thought it was fantastic. Are you going to do the the male version too? I asked Ron and he hasn't gotten back to me and I think maybe Anne stole it. Oh, uh, okay. That'd it's, be cool to see. I mean, I don't know. It's always good to see different interpretations, but sometimes I know he likes certain things if it's within their within the same family to be done by the same painter just because oh, well. our styles can be so different um it'd be cool to see you do that regardless i'm sure you you put that in on your pledge and your kickstarter right it is it is in my pledge and i'm sad that i must wait for it but i will be patient and i to paint other things and yes yes i'm totally gonna paint it <laughs> well i'm sure if you harass ron enough um he I can might, maybe figure you know? out a way to get you a copy in the meantime uh, all right yeah. It's good to harass. It's um, Aaron's paint job was a maze ball. Yeah, see, Jean even said that your paint job was a maze Aww. ball. Yeah, yeah. And and getting ready to inherit the Earth Young eyeballs. Oh, eyeball. I, yeah. Um, what? I think that Rhonda's talking about the next generation of painters coming out because all of us are getting so old that we can't see anymore. Um, right. Yeah, I'll just keep painting bigger and bigger things. Um, that's that's kind of why I'm working on this big guy. Um, it's it helps. It helps. Love that metal. Thanks. Thanks. You you taught me how to do that once, long long ago, in a galaxy <laughs> far far away. I took Michael Proctor's class on shaded metallics, and I still have the figure. Actually, do you have it? Does it look okay? I keep all my old class figures that I take classes for, so I can go. Okay, now how did I do? This? That is uh, that is just some great advice right there. I do the same thing too. I have a Marika piece from a, a class. I I have two Marika pieces from from the class that she that one it was my class mini, but one that she used as the demo for one of them. It was a female flesh class or something like that, and uh, I refer to it even to this day. I mean, even Doug Jones is he stopped painting a long time ago. He was a fantastic Colorado painter, Slayer Sword winner and stuff. He used to come oh, to our wow. paint clubs. And uh, I have a, he taught me how to paint gyms, one, one of our uh, weekend, oh, you know, cool. workshop kind of things. And I still have that. And, if, you know, it's not often, for some reason or another, I don't paint gyms a ton anymore. But uh, when I do, I always grab that thing. I'm like, okay, how did Doug do it? And I look at him, I'm like, okay. And it helps remind me, you know, what to do. It's good to have those little references. And it's nice to have uh, photo references. You can gather those all the place, but seeing them in person is a big difference for me at least I, I it makes more of an impact for me um just go back and say ah there's exactly how they did that so um thank but, goodness for the internet because i did not grow up with that and no. it's been so nice to be able to google something and go okay that's actually what it looks like so how do i paint that all right so your real work world there. do they know what you do do they know your miniatures and they, that you paint miniatures and all that stuff? They do. They think I'm crazy. That you're a <laughs> that you're a world famous, world renowned um, miniature painter. I don't painter. tell them that. I just say I'm going to go to Texas and paint this weekend. I'll see you guys later. <laughs> <laughs> and do any of them have any of them asked any additional questions, or they're just like later, dork? You know, and then it you're depends. gone. Okay. It depends. My my old office manager before she retired, I gave her one of my old cloud giantesses. Uh -huh. um, and she says she keeps it, you know, by her bedside, you know, you know to ward off things. evil so she, spirits. She gets and... really excited about it. Um, my partners are like, oh, that's nice. And that's really about it. <laughs> that's cute. <laughs> I'm glad you have a hobby. <laughs> oh, good for you. <laughs> they worry about me because I don't get out much. You know? Oh, okay. But you travel. Good. She's getting out. She has a hobby. <laughs> you, you've traveled a lot though, right? Do, well, not since COVID, but, um, yeah. but yeah, I do. I love to travel. That is my uh -huh. other hobby. Like, inspirational. Where is, if you had to say, the coolest place you've ever been, what's the coolest place you've ever been? It's really Try. hard, but 
probably the Galapagos Islands. Ah, I was supposed to go that there. Amazing. Yeah, we had to cancel our oh, trip. Oh, that's cool. Yeah. Oh, because oh, I'm sorry. is it the kitchen? No, um, the kitchen is another story. But no, we were going to go there, and we had to cancel that due to uh, Michelle's um, job was changing at the time, so we just decided to postpone it. But yeah, we were going to go there. Actually, you mentioned scuba diving earlier. Um, we're big scuba divers, and we were going to go there on a big scuba diving trip. Um, oh, that would be amazing. Yeah, yeah, I think it'd be super duper cool. So that's that's still on our bucket list to do. Is that? Um, I think that would be a lot of fun to do. But you're so you did a, a kind of a land based excursion and stuff. Um, well, you get on a boat, um, and and it's not a big boat; it's a little boat, and just go around to the different islands. And we were there for about a week, and you'd spend a day on the island or a half day on the island and a half day in the water, you know, doing snorkeling. Mm -hmm. um, and you're with a guide the whole time. You can't go off by yourself very protected and it's insane the animals have absolutely no fear i've never seen anything like it i was taking a video of the blue-footed boobies and while mm -hmm. i was taking that video i noticed later on that i didn't even see it there was a snake crossing in front of the boobies that just it crossed right <laughs> by my feet you know at the bottom of the and i didn't even see it and oh, i yeah? didn't care that i was there it was <laughs> unreal oh that's awesome that's awesome uh let's see here Oh, Jean said hashtag the kitchen. We did make progress on the kitchen for those that even remotely care about the progress of it. It's been, it was supposed to be, Aaron, it's supposed to be a six to eight week process. I heard this and it's how many months now? Oh my freaking Lord. It is, uh, we're in week 13, 14 right now, I think. But we what did. Happened? Well, there was it was a it was a um, a laundry list of of problems, but the first and foremost was our contractor just is can I say shit the bed? Um, probably not, um, but yeah, something like that. He just he just just didn't work out. Just started um, making horrible decisions and couldn't cut things straight and couldn't measure right and messed up some some cabinets and messed up some stuff that finally we called the designer in and she's the one that referred him and basically set up the, the relationship and she said you're done um so um, we went a few weeks and then last wednesday we had a, a new contractor come in and he did almost completely finish my little coffee bar um so Saw that that looks good thanks i love that tile so that's cool um and then so we have more stuff coming this week and i think next week or so he'll be coming back to we have two more big phases left um, to do. Finish up the kitchen with some replacement of drawers and what have you and some baseboard kind of crap. And and then um, the whole kitchen, the whole, that's one main side. And then where the ovens go in, the, the one of the other on the list of problems was the dimensions that the oven manufacturer gave us for the, cust the cabinets to be built were wrong <laughs> so no. we got them in so the ovens don't fit and so um that has to be okay. reordered so yeah it's but it's you know look it's still going to be awesome it's just going to take a little bit longer than expected so it's i can't complain um i can you complain but yeah it. yeah exactly exactly the kitchen is the most important room in the house yes it yeah, it is. It is. It's been, I mean, it's, and the fu the funny thing is when the whole COVID thing was in full bloom, um, and we let's talk about that a little bit, um, we decided, well, hell, let's not have a kitchen during this time. <laughs> yeah, that makes it harder to <laughs> bake bread, which is the best coping mechanism ever. Oh, I made bread this weekend. It was Did you really? Are you a good, yeah. are you a big baker? Oh, actually, that was the first time I've ever made bread in my life. And oh. it rose, and it was three times the size of the original loaf of bread. Like, it just it got bigger. How? Why did it get bigger? All right. So let's do a little PSA a portion of the, um, of the show. Let's um, talk a little bit, not to get too serious here, but since I have you on, I think it's important to say, all right, COVID. What's what's the reality? We should. I talk about the show. Hey, wash your face and stop touching strange people, right? right. Um, those. Right. That's my lame um, excuses, or, or uh, I don't know what's the word I'm trying to use, but that's my that's my advice. Um, do you, as a physician, is there anything that people are kind of missing, or maybe you think you see this in the real world that need to be re people need to be reminded of? I'm a huge fan of masks. Yeah. You no, know, and I wasn't always because I was like, well, you know. 
if it's not an N95, maybe it's not as good. But there's been some pretty good evidence that it's better mm-hmm. and that it helps. And I mean, yeah, please don't touch your face. Please don't pick your nose or I've got to stop biting my fingernails. And I've really gotten good about not biting my fingernails. Me too. I'm, I'm, I've been a habitual fingernail biter forever. Um, but do you wear, you wear a mask? I do. I wear an N95 every day and it, I'm, I'm getting tired of it because it cuts into my face. Yeah. And it, I can taste it at the end of the day. I still have that chemical taste in my mouth mm-hmm. when I'm trying to like eat dinner. I'm like, where I feel like I'm still wearing my mask. Yeah. Um, so, you know, and everybody who comes into our office has to wear a mask. We don't let anybody in without them. And we even bought some extra ones that we're giving to patients if they need them, mm-hmm. so, you know, to try to help with that because we want to, you know, try to facilitate. But yeah, if I just want everybody to not do anything unless they absolutely have to be safe. It's, it's okay to be social. You know, the great thing about the internet is we can spend time with our friends and family on Zoom or, you know, any of those other platforms. Um, but so, yeah, just, you know, do you um, do you wear uh, you wear a mask when you go out to the grocery store? I do I wear a mask? I actually the cable guy came over to fix a cable the other day, and I wore mm-hmm. my mask while he was in the house. Good. Okay. Yeah, when I'm in my house, I don't usually wear my mask. Yeah, but, but yeah, if, if I go out if I'm gonna yeah, and I'll go to the grocery store every two weeks instead of every week, and I cook so that I can eat for the whole week without having to go anywhere. Mm-hmm. So I. I I, my parents, they're in their 70s and their 80s. I, the main reason I don't want to get sick is I don't want to get my patients sick because many yeah. of them can't afford to get sick. They will yeah. die. Yeah. So I have to keep anybody else from getting it in my office. Um, when I go out, I don't want to give it to the little old lady down the street because I don't want to kill her either. Yeah. Do you um, yeah. get tested regularly since you're in the healthcare field or are you under a certain mm-hmm. reg- uh, regime for that? Uh, no, no, only symptomatic. Uh, mm-hmm. What we're doing right now with the hospital, and they've, you know, they've been changing. They give us the numbers every day. We get the numbers from the health department, from the county, our hospital, um, you know, and they give it to us every day or every other day. I'm, I'm tired of numbers. Hospital gets tested. Um, mm-hmm. Anyone who's admitted. Um, so, like, I had did an emergency surgery the other day, and you know, she was an unknown, so we just all wear our masks the whole time. I tested her before the surgery. We kept her in a special room, and I got her test back two days later, and it was negative, so we were in the clear. But um, pretty much anybody who comes in gets tested, and if they're unknown and symptomatic, they have a special unit they go to. If they're positive, they have a special unit they go to, and we kind of keep them away from everyone else. Um, just because that's the only way we're going to you know, fix it is to keep it from spreading. Yeah. Are we still making progress on, on flattening the curve? Or has there been a spike um, in your area? Uh, in our area, cases are going up. Um, they're higher than they have been. Mm-hmm. They've been steadily rising now for the last month or so. Um, we haven't. We've just got to the point where we may potentially overwhelm our ER system. Got a lot of cases. My county isn't so bad because we're fairly rural, um, but we're right next to Charlotte, which has the highest number of cases in our state. Mm-hmm. So some states are doing better than others at flattening the curve. We were doing great for a while, but I'm not sure where we're going to go in the next couple of weeks. Um, you know, just everything's been, you know, we've been opening up. Everybody's going out to the store. Um, you know, I'll go to the store and I'll wear my mask and I'll go at seven in the morning so that no one else is in the store, but no one else is wearing a mask. I have noticed that. Yeah. And everybody gets to do what they want, you know, and I don't, you know, want to interfere with anybody's ability to breathe or, or freedom. But I, I do know from, I have a master's in public health, which is like my, like the other side of my life, which is looking at numbers and going, guys, um, I, I love you. I, I don't want you to die. Can, can we work together here? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think there was, um, there was an exhaustion point, right? Um, in this and where things needed to be, I don't know, the, the powers that be felt like they needed to relax a little bit because of the exhaustion point too. But with that being said, that. yeah, with that being said, I mean, all of us should be cognizant of our own health and then how it affects other people around us. And I hear the same thing with my job. It's just about us. Yeah, no. And, but I'm, it, I'm pretty healthy. I'll probably survive, but my mom and my dad probably won't. Yeah, same here. So my parents are probably around the same age as yours are, and it would be, yeah, it would be just, it wouldn't be good. And I told my dad that. I'm like, stay in the house. <laughs> don't go anywhere. <laughs> you, don't stay, don't go, don't go anywhere. So That's it. Yeah, no, dad, you can't go to tennis. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> All right. PSA time over, right? Right. Uh, 
And uh, back to the fun stuff. Back back to the fun stuff. Um, do working on a little more shade of metallics. Um, I again every show I forget to go over the colors that I'm using. So for my shade of metallics, and you may have remembered this in the class that um, you attended. I tend to go with some very consistent um, paint colors, metallic colors. I have tarnished steel, if you remember that. Um, scorched metal is kind of the newer ad for me. Um, aged pewter, those aged pewter and tarnished steel is like my go-betweens between um, steel. And the difference between them, you can see this one's got a little blue and this one's got a little more brown in it. So you, this one works well, with blue liner and whatnot. And uh, the pewter is really cool. It kind of goes in between um, steel and um, bronze. And I can't find. Also, real quick, yeah, uh, Proctor. Um, Rhonda had texted me because she said she texted you, but, mm -hmm. uh, but you didn't answer your phone, which is good. Don't look at your phone. Yeah. Um, but uh, she said someone had asked uh, how to use metallics yeah. on a wet palette without them falling out of suspension. See, there's the question. It's on screen right, right there. Right there. <laughs> there it is. Awesome. Okay. How do I use it without them falling under suspension? So when I put metallic paint on my wet palette, I just put them straight out of the bottle. And I don't cut them at all. Where other paints, I'll um, mix in a little bit of water in, go a little 50-50 on my wet palette and thin a little bit more. Um, then I'll take, and you can see in the wet palette, the bronze a little bit. And I will, I'm going to move this forward so you can see it actually on the big screen. This is full, um, straight out of the bottle. And you'll see it's kind of separating a little bit. If it's starting to... Um, See this clay shaper? You do this. I use. I have. I bought this clay shaper, and the light colored one is the wrong kind. Of, wrong kind to buy if you want to use it for sculpting green stuff. It's too soft. And it's way too soft. It bends way too much for my taste. But I decided, to, like, I'll use this to mix my paints. That way, I'm not screwing up another brush, right? And then I'll just wipe it off. And then you can just redo it that way. So, but if you want it a little bit thinner. As you're applying the metallic, I take some of my water and I'll have a little bit on the side and I'll just take a little bit of my straight paint and add a tiny bit of water for what I need and maybe bring it out this way. That way it won't totally loose, um, go into suspension and I'll break apart and everything. But if you don't do anything and you can see this gold right here, it's kind of starting to do that. Use your clay shaper or if you don't have one of those, there's another nice thing in the other end of your brush. Um, and kind of mix it up a little bit too. And I'll go in and, and remix them on a pretty regular basis too. So thank you for the, the chat question, um, text question there, Rhonda. Um, but the other paint color, oh, here it is, um, Old Bronze. Um, probably the two top colors that I go with are Old Bronze and Tarnished Steel. And what we didn't show off today that I've shown off on other Shade of Metallics um, video tutorials and when I do my um, ReaperCon class I'm going to do Shade of Metallics again is one of my things. If I will um, prime all my miniatures, well I do Zenithal black and then white on top, but I will if something's going to be steel I will tend to paint it with the desaturated blue. Ash and blue tends to be the color I'll grab a lot and then for usually anything gold, I mean gold or bronze or copper or whatever I'll do a desaturated green this might have a little bit more color than not. Um, I mean, more saturation than not. So maybe something like a, um, the muddy olive color is a good one too. Or there's the the uh, forest green, jungle jungle green, or something like that. I use that a lot too. Just something desaturated. And what that does is, if you paint one of these metallic paints over a white primer, um, that white primer will zap some of the cool metallicness of the paint. It'll kind of rob it of its impact. Um, the color under it um, helps it read a little bit more. So if you want your bronzes or your, your golds to have some nice green to it or your coppers to have some nice green, you can have that color in there. Now, play around with other base colors underneath and stuff. Um, I'll use a rusty, flat, uh, desaturated orange or desaturated red sometimes with gold if I really want it to be... Um, just to kind of start going through that vibe as well. So that's that as well. And then you've seen 
uh, a ton. Oh, some of the other colors that I have on the palette or newer colors, um, and these are part of the Pathfinder line, um, and I just wanted to experiment with them a little bit. This Kelashite Gold is really cool. And the bri, bri Bronze, I don't know if it's supposed to be Bright Bronze or just Bright Bronze. Um, there's no T, so I'm, it's Bright Bronze. Um, it's really cool as well. There's Crusader Silver as well. Um, and then, I've done this on all my other ones. There's I will never, I never talk about any non-Reaper paints because I'm 99% of the paints I paint with are Reaper. Um, but there's a metal medium made by Vallejo, um, and it is a pure white. And it's great for um, spot highlights, and it's great for highlighting up on your, um, let me see, there it is right here. Um, there it is right there. So it's super bright white. And I use that for hot highlights for um, shade of metallics as well. But all these other colors that you'll see, the oranges and the, the green and the blue and whatnot are kind of tint colors that I'll throw in. And you can see on, on his, um, what's, what are these little things called again? I don't know. His little, I don't know, metal beltly thingies. Um, there's going to be all kinds of greens and whatnot in there and adding additional colors into the metallics because metallics are going to be pulling colors from other areas and just go crazy. It's, it's good to have strappy things. Um, um, strappy thingies as Derek says. Um, so it's good to have that kind of stuff in there as well. So that's what I'm going to be doing a little bit more of in the show. So do you paint much with metallics, Aaron, or you kind of go a back to bit. I've been doing more non-metallic um, metal yeah. than than the true metallic. Um, I like it. Mm -hmm. um, it. I get impatient because I feel like I want to do a lot of layers, which is the normal way I paint. But if I do that too much with the metallics, I feel like they lose just some of the nice quality that they have if I do too many layers. Yeah, yeah. And I have to um, paint differently with them. I have to think differently. You do. It's almost like a different medium, isn't it? It's like, okay, mm -hmm. these are paints and whatnot, and especially if you do, you know, uh, shade of metallics and whatnot. You're using metallics, and you're using them for the base coat, and you're using them to pick out some highlights at towards the end. Um, mm -hmm. But the rest of the time, you are basically going back to your acrylic paints, and you're layering with them. Another, mm -hmm. another, kick, another key tip here is when you're painting with metallics, try... Try very hard to have two brushes. One is going to be your metallics brush, and one's going to be your acrylics brush. And then try to have two different waters. One water, this water is my non-metallic water. I get flakes in everything. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> glitter. I can't win with glitter. And oh. the thing with shade of metallics is the goal of it is to use the acrylic paints to knock back the, sh the the shiny part, the flaky part, right? Um, and so if you mess up and you get some into your water or whatever, um, you're, you're, what you're trying to knock back those shadows where the light isn't hitting the metal so the, the reflectiveness isn't happening, um, it, you know, you're, you're losing that effect if you get a little of that in there. But, God, it happens all the time. It happens to me all the time. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, I don't know. I don't know. So, oh, Looking Justin, great. thank you, thank you. Um, you know, do you get so a lot of times? Um, and I get, I've got this question a lot. When, when do you know you're done? I'm tired of painting. <laughs> <laughs> um, when I, when I realize I'm starting to mess up things and I've, I, I can't make it any better, and I've. I have to do something else. I have to do a new project. Yeah, yeah, and then you just you just call that one done at that point. I abandon it. Yeah. Yeah, abandon yeah. is the key word. Yeah, because you can continue, and there's nothing ever finished. It's just like, yeah, that's good. That's yeah. that's it. I want to do something else. And for me, it's like I got all these other things. I'm just jazzed about something else at this point. And that's not that I'm not here, but sometimes you know. Um, you just feel like, oh my God, am I ever going to get this finished? Um, am I ever going to get this done? How can I photograph this so people can't see the stuff I didn't finish? <laughs> 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 Something like that too, right? Something like that. Um, but uh, yeah, Justin, are we missing anything in the chat or whatever? 
Uh, no, there's just uh, a lot of conversation about, uh, well, at one point it was about masks. Yeah. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> yeah. No problem. Um, but nothing crazy. Yeah. Now, Sharky says, are there two different water cups so you don't mix the flavors up when you drink from them? Yes, yes. Um, two different water cups. Um, I have my own water cup that I drink out of that has its own cap. Um, so I have, will <laughs> never, you'll never see me use a Reaper Bones paint cup thingy to drink out of because like everything that i learn i learn everything the hard way um so after you take a big swallow of a a paint mixed cup acrylic's better you than dip a, your brush in your glass of water oh my god yeah so your mixed that. drink that you've just made you know um yeah so you don't do that so yeah i have i i drink out of this so i don't i don't do anything in that, that way i don't spill everything anywhere everywhere anyways so, was there what else you got for me, Justin, for us? Um, let's see here. You know, one thing that we've been very successful in this show today, Justin, What's is that? there's been no bus sightings. No, there hasn't. It's nice. Yeah, hey, yeah. Boxer got through an entire episode nice. without running anyone over with a bus. <laughs> <laughs> That's because I had um, Sweet Aaron on, who's just a positive. Uh, inspirational um, person, influence. And I'll cry if you're mean to me. Yes. Also, <laughs> keep in mind, this is, this is also just kind of a logistical thing here. Like, I don't know that if you ran over Aaron that it would even hit her. It might pass cleanly over her. I 